The hallway light clicked off, and seven-year-old Charlie Anning held his elephant just that bit tighter. Okay, he said as he stared into the stuffed toy's eyes with a deadly seriousness. Tonight's the big night, Eli. He looked past Eli's fuzzy, crooked trunk to the chair across the room. Shrouded in darkness now, Charlie's young mind beginning to turn the nothing shadows into shapes and patterns. Don't be a wuss, he scolded the elephant. Mrs. Crebin's not real. Don't you want to be a big kid? He imagined Eli's warm, Tom Baker-esque voice reply, You're right. I'm sorry. It wasn't very grown up of me at all, was it? Yes, Charlie was indeed very grown up. Though he looked back to the chair and swallowed. Mrs. Crevin. Oh, it was always Mrs. Crevin. She was the cause of almost all of his nightmare. She, as he saw her, was what could be best described as a bipedal dog in a dress. But ultimately, she was little more than the way the shadow of his bedroom door mixed with the evening dark upon the corner chair in his room. Mrs. Crebin was not real. On some level, he might have known that, but seven-year-olds, no matter how allegedly grown up, are especially susceptible to the terrors of the imagination. He'd see her vague shape sitting in the chair, so he'd pull the blankets up over his head, assuring Eli that silence would keep them safe. Other times, the creaks and groans of the rafters would have his mind wander. Is she in the roof? Walking around on her strange dog-like feet? Maybe she lives up there. Maybe she's waiting up there. Then, at other times, he thought he saw her in the corners of doorways, head just slightly poking out at him, visible only through the corner of his eye and sensed only by the hairs on the back of his neck. So there he was, little Charlie Anning, always looking over his shoulder, never truly seeing anything, but quietly certain something watched him. I don't want to sleep with the lights on anymore, he told his dad one night. I'm scared of Mrs. Crebin. His father, a tired but understanding man, promised him, Charlie, they're just scary thoughts, that's all. It's all in your head. We only really give these things as much power as we choose. What do you mean? How do I put this? His father searched for the best way to explain to a child. It's like Eli. Mrs. Crebin is just you playing pretend. You see shadows at night and you give them voices and names. It's all just pretend. Charlie hugged his elephant and protested. Eli's real, you doofus. Right, oh, of course, my apologies. His father folded up his newspaper and disappeared into another room, returning with a torch in hand. You see this? He said as he held the blue metallic thing to Charlie's face. Take it to bed with you tonight. And when you think you see Mrs. Crebin, just flick it on and point. And I promise, you'll see that there's nothing there. Another child might have thrown a tantrum, insisted on sleeping with the lights on. But for Charlie, his father's word was law. So there he was, lying in bed, scolding Eli for being a scaredy cat and trying to fall asleep. The house was quiet. Faint sounds sounded so large as it breathed in and out, cooling in the night air. A rustle of a tree outside, the distant whine of a car in desperate need of a service. Then finally, the rafters. 
Charlie shivered as he heard them creak and groan. What is she doing up there? No. No. He argued with himself. I'm just playing pretend. It's just the roof. Still, though, he pulled the blankets up higher, up under his chin, and peered over them to the door. Slightly ajar, as always. Beyond, just out of view, was the edge of something. Black. Solid. Charlie gasped and quickly covered his mouth. It's nothing, he thought. You're just playing pretend. That's all. Clinging to his father's courage uncertainly, shakily, Charlie slid the torch out from under his blankets, and in a moment of held breath, flicked it on, aiming it at the shape beyond the door. He jolted as the light revealed it to truly be there. But before he screamed, he began to realise. The shape, this solid, scary thing watching from the doorway, it was little more than the edge of a photo frame, resting upon the opposite wall and made of dark wood. In the absence of light, it appeared different, more menacing. Charlie flicked the light off and on again, trying to familiarise himself with it. And the more he did, the less and less it looked like a monster, and the more its evening shadow took on its picture frame form. He sighed. See? Dad was right. You shouldn't have doubted him for a second, he scolded Eli again. But then, of course, there was the chair. The chair in the corner of the room. The chair that he had decided belonged to the imaginary Mrs. Krebin. She's not real, Charlie, he made Eli say. But still, the little boy was too afraid to look at the chair. Fear of the unknown is a powerful thing. And for Charlie, it may very well have been scarier to look in the chair and see nothing than it was to look and see something. Did he want to play with that? Could he? Would he choose to angle his torch and look upon the tall, dress-clad dog woman that was Mrs. Krebin? Eli, it's okay. Don't be a sook. You know it's made up. You know it. Charlie nodded at his own veiled encouragement and slowly turned to the chair. From the protection of his bed, he saw her, sat as she always was in her corner chair, still and watching. Charlie squeaked loud enough that he heard his voice echo down the hall igniting the additional fear of waking his father. He pulled the blankets up over his head and held Eli close, as if the fabric and the elephant would protect him. It was humid under the blankets. His hot breath quickly made the air beneath them thick and hard to breathe. He had to come up for air. A door creaked somewhere in the house and he knew he'd woken his father, but the more imminent threat was the dog woman. Charlie peered over his blankets again, the corner chair where she sat, still silent, still watching, unmoving. He reached for the torch. Don't do it, Eli said in his head. I changed my mind. She's real. She's real. But still, he slid his thumb over the rubber button of his torch and angled it at the corner. Don't! She'll jump out at you. She'll take you up into the roof and eat your guts. Charlie froze, held his breath, and clicked on the torch. Nothing. In the torchlight, the dog woman that was Mrs. Crabbin vanished into an empty chair. Charlie turned it off and on, seeing the chair in nightlight, how the shadows settled on it, and in torchlight, how empty it truly was. And it was in that moment 
but Charlie conquered his fear. His heart beat now not with horror, but joy. Excited with relief, he clutched at Eli. I always knew she wasn't real, he decided, the elephant said. He heard his father's feet coming down the hall as he laughed at his own childishness. Charlie cried as he saw the door begin to open. Dad! Dad, look, you were right! When I turned on the torch, there's nothing there! Charlie pointed the light at the chair and turned it on and off a few times to illustrate his point. He was like a kid that just mastered the art of riding a bike. He felt the bed creak as his father sat on the end to watch him, proudly. It was that moment that changed everything. As he turned to his father, he saw what at first his mind only registered as a shape. The shape of a man, naked, wet. Its hairless body watched and breathed with all the minor movements of a living thing. Charlie's whole body prickled with goosebumps, and he felt his bones go rigid as the alien thing watched him. He clicked his torch's light over and over again, but the thing remained. Through hollow eyes it watched him, and through a distended mouth it spoke. Thanks for helping me find your room. G'day guys. I hope you enjoyed that story and thank you so much for giving it a listen. Remember, if you want some more scary stories, you can go to the Scary Stories for Late Nights playlist. Dusk Bowl has been a fantastic project to work on and remember, if you've got any fanfic or fan art or any just questions about the series, feel free to email me at duskbowl.fm at gmail.com. I love every single one of you and you've made being a microtuber probably one of the best experiences of my life. I want to give special thanks to my patrons of course, being Lady Nevermore, Skulk Queen, Catherine Gordon, The Curator and Stephen Stevens. If you see them in the comments, please say good day. And to all of you, I bid you logs of love and shit shippers.